Black history in Delaware County goes back to before its founding in 1789. As one of the oldest settlements in Pennsylvania, it was the crucible of William Penn's holy experiment of religious freedom and equal treatment for all. By the 1830s, because of its proximity to Philadelphia and other free regions, Delaware County became a very important spot on the Underground Railroad. Upper Darby Historic Commissioner Bart Everts explains more. By At least by the 1830s, there's documented evidence of travelers um, on the Underground Railroad coming through Delaware County. Um, the Darby Meeting House and Howard House on Westchester Pike uh, were both meeting places for members of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society. They were having active meetings at both of these locations. Um, and of course, the, the Darby uh, Meeting House being Quakers, they were already heavily involved in the anti-slavery movement. So the, the, the Garrett family, they were one of the main um, families involved in, in this. There's Thomas Garrett and Edward Garrett. Um, and so their connection, they both were members of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, um, and they guided hundreds of self, self-liberated Black folks through Delaware County. Notable things about the Garretts is they had properties in Wilmington, Delaware, which was the northernmost slave state, and then also in Upper Darby. So for the people traveling through the Underground Railroad, often um, they would go through Thomas Garrett's property in Wilmington um, on their way to Upper Darby, and Delaware County would be the first free soil that they would have ever stepped on in their lives. And Garrett was really uncompromising in his abolitionist work. Um, He was fined by the Supreme Court. He was jailed under the Fugitive Slave Act uh, for aiding um, African-Americans in their liberation. One of the people that the Garretts would have worked with is William Still. Still, who worked as an abolitionist based in Philadelphia, also chaired a vigilance committee which looked out for and helped recently escaped slaves in the city to find passage for the North. Everts continues. And the two of them uh, corresponded often on sometimes just general issues on abolition, on, on slavery, but also on um, safely bringing folks who had left escaped slavery up through um, Delaware County and, and and from that path to Wilmington. So uh, still wrote what, you know, even to this day is probably one of the premier firsthand accounts of the Underground Railroad. And in there, um, he includes uh, correspondence with Thomas Garrett. Um, probably the most notable one is um, a woman named Ann Jackson and her children who came up through the Wilmington home um, into Upper Darby, and it was William Still who actually wrote a letter to Thomas Garrett saying that there was a woman and a family which um, needed passage up through uh, Upper Darby and to get into Philadelphia where there were um, others you know, ready to aid them on, on their trip further north. And of course, Still, again, was probably the most notable firsthand um, documenter of the Underground Railroad. Um, he wrote a book shortly after the Civil War documenting um, his experiences based on on letters and, and um, diaries and documents um, that really showed firsthand not just the abolitionists themselves, but the people who were passing through. The book that Bart Everts is referencing is called The Underground Railroad Records, a book written by William Still, an African-American abolitionist, and it can be purchased wherever books are sold. Everett, as a part of his position as a Upper Darby Historic Commissioner, produced a Upper Darby Underground Railroad walking tour. He explains further here. I loved having the opportunity to work with the commission and the mayor on, on creating this walking tour that would highlight the history. But it was just fascinating that there are so many sites in this um, township. Um, you know, they're for the size of the township. I mean, it. It really was a centerpiece to the Philadelphia region's abolitionist history and Underground Railroad history. Obviously, we had the sites, so we just had to design a map um, of the sites. We created a really nice um, glossy brochure. People can um, either download or we had print copies as well. I think people were just looking for opportunities to go out and and to explore this history. Um, And then that, of course, combined with this that the summer of racial reckoning where people were looking um, more into deeply into American history as well. And I think that um, this tour sort of picked up on on that as well. As time moved forward past the end of the American Civil War and into the 20th century, our story does too. 
Our story goes to 1902 in the small town of Collingdale, where once a small parcel of land owned by the Bartrams was sold to John Ashbury to create one of the first African-American cemeteries. For more information on that, I talked to Eaton Cemetery board member Craig Stutman. Five founders were creating this land because um, the many of the city cemeteries from Philly were um, kind of either in disrepair or condemned. Um, there wasn't an African-American uh, public burial ground that was really large anymore. And so they, they wanted, I mean, there were parochial ones, there were small um, cemeteries here and there, but the, the idea was to, to have a large scale African-American cemetery in southeastern PA, Delaware County, uh, within rolling farms of where the Bartram Gardens used to um, exist. And uh, John Tyler, uh, who had owned the property uh, and bought it from the Bartrams, uh, Bartram family sold it to um, John Asbury for, I think it was a uh, $1 kind of uh, transaction. And uh, there was five founding members, African-American men, John Asbury, uh, Charles Jones, Daniel Parvis, Jerome Bacon, and Martin Lehman. Uh, John Asbury was a lawyer, and uh, he actually would become one of the first, not the first, but one of the first um, African-American state representatives for, uh, for Pennsylvania. Uh, would have to go to court several times to keep the idea of the cemetery um, alive because the town of Collingsdale actually did protest the, the purchase and was not happy that there was going to be um, a, an African-American cemetery in their backyard. Um, Asbury successfully defended um, the cemetery company and eventually um, an injunction was lifted that was placed on the cemetery as a holding point. To prevent further troubles with the town, the first burials were done in secret. Felicine Cromwell was the first one buried in Eden Cemetery. It's kind of uh, ironic, but not ironic, you know, in the United States that there, the, these, this African-American group is trying to create a cemetery for African-Americans and run into the, the issue of segregation, racism, etc., um, as they're trying to create a segregated cemetery for that matter, because of the fact that most cemeteries that were white were not allowing integration anyway. And if there were examples of that, you often were, you know, in segregated sections, um, buried in segregated sections, even Quaker cemeteries. It was kind of an, an auspicious uh, beginning um, to an incredible uh, story of not only burying individuals for 121 years now, but also reinterring uh, historic cemeteries, cemeteries from the city of Philadelphia, like Lebanon and Olive, that go back as far as 1849, um, were reinterred out in Eden right from the beginning. So in that first few decades, you have um, stories of those reinterments of the of the um, thousands of individuals that uh, incredibly historic figures that are at Eden Cemetery are not just there from 1902 to the present, but also are there from historic reinterments. Um, throughout the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. Too. You also, in the early years, have a uh, well noticeable when you go down to Eden is this holding cell uh, with a, a really large red door and it's kind of built into the earthen mound below the John Brown section. And cemeteries would often have, because th the ground would be frozen potentially um, and uh, during particular, particular times of year, so sometimes bodies were there to kind of hold until the ground thawed. Um, other times, bodies might be there because of quarantine, because of disease, is a really uh, kind of a beautiful material piece of the cemetery. I think the designs here are intentionally done by these uh, founders and moving forward and the board members moving forward and trying to cre create a, a really beautiful space. The most famous residents interred in Eden Cemetery are probably William Still, Octavius Cato, and Marian Anderson. Marian Anderson, of course, is the famous African-American opera singer who, in 1939, due to racial segregation, was barred from singing to an integrated audience in Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. 
by the daughters of the American Revolution. In response to that, the First Lady at the time, Eleanor Roosevelt, offered the steps of the Lincoln Memorial as a venue for Marian Anderson. Anderson's performance on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial is iconic and was documented in a documentary at the time. She sang before an integrated crowd of more than 75,000 people and a radio audience in the millions. In 1993, she was interred in Eaton Cemetery. As we pray, blessed our feet, stray from places a God will let be. Blessed our heart, I was happy to be here, first of all, because I was going to a big school. I was coming from a one-room schoolhouse. So, oh, this was all new and exciting. But I, you know, I soon found out that, that racially it was different. Had some experiences that my mother had. Uh, she was not able to get a teaching job in Delaware County because she was not uh, really politically affiliated. Um, I can go back to um, grade school. I went to a Catholic uh, school from first grade to 12th grade. Um, we were the only Blacks in that um, school at that time. I had a, a cousin in second grade, a brother in third, a sister in eighth, and I, we face racism. <laughs> and you wouldn't think, um, as you go back, you wouldn't think that it would happen in a Catholic school, but it did. Um, people are people, regardless of what they, the labels give them. Well, there has been employment injustices that um, affected persons of color in, in Delaware County, um, especially when it came to um, employment in political um, arenas like county government, local government at that particular time, because it was controlled by a one party control. So therefore, it wasn't opportunities for people of color that weren't al aligned with them to get um, jobs in those particular um, in those particular areas of government. Not saying that, you know, I didn't have opportunity to work. I did, uh, I, I went to school, got my degrees in order to do what I had to do. And I wasn't obligated to any, any particular connect that got me the employment that I needed for myself. And then later on for family. Actually at a child, you're not, really quite aware of how really uh, racially divided the city was because I came from Chester County with a little bit of distant, a different history, but it didn't bother me. I was happy to be here, first of all, because I was going to a big school. I was coming from a one-room schoolhouse. Oh, this was all new and exciting, but I, you know, I soon found out that, that racially it was different. And I remember in sixth grade, um, the nuns did not allow lay teachers to teach religion. So the, my nun, she left to go to this teacher who was teaching, I think, second grade at the time, to her room to teach religion. And the teacher from that particular um, class, a lay teacher, came to teach social studies in sixth grade. Well, the experience was um, she was talking about slavery and at that particular time. So being the only Afro-American in that particular classroom and, you know, one of the six or four of the in the school, 
She uh, was talking about racism and she decided to ask about the 13th, the 14th and the 15th Amendment. So she gets to my row and I'm about the fifth or sixth person in the row. And so the first person, she asked them, do you know the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment? And the person said, no. She gets to the second person, asked the same question. They said, no. Gets to the third person, same thing, no. Gets to the fourth person, same thing, no. Gets to me. And I say, well, since everybody else said no, I'm thinking to myself, I might as well say no too. So then she stops and she says, of all people, you should know the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. And that just sent a chill through me. And um, at the end of that class, I walked to the back of the classroom to go out to meet her as she was leaving the room, but she spent a lot of time talking to the nun and I don't know what they were talking about. And I wanted to ask her, you know, why she singled me out. But um, her response wasn't one at that time that I could understand. I guess it was above my, at that particular time, dealing with the racism and then dealing with her not, Realizing, I, I, as I think about today, I guess she didn't realize the impact that that would have on me. She didn't. Well, she would not have gotten a job in Upper Chichester because there were no black teachers in Upper Chichester for many, many years. So she tried to get a job in the Chester Upland School District. But because she was not a Republican um, and not from Chester, she was asked to pay to get a job. Gives I don't know which government official it was. Uh, she didn't have the money to do that. So she was never able to use her teaching degree until I was about in 10th grade. And I went to Douglas, Frederick Douglas Junior High School. That was my first encounter with a entire black staff. In fact, my first black teachers, even um, seeing black teachers like in a school with a black principal. So all that was enlightening to me. I really, really appreciate it. And I was very excited that we were changing rooms. However, I lived at 1426 Providence Avenue about two, three blocks from Smedley. And those that uh, back in the day, we used to have playgrounds and kids would spend the whole day at the playground. Well, the playground was totally integrated with the youngsters from the community. So when I got ready to go to school, we were split. I had to go, what's Douglas, maybe two, three miles south. And Smedley was this two or three blocks north. But I had, and when Douglas was all black and Smedley was all white. Well, that was interesting. I enjoyed Douglas, don't get me wrong. I had the best teachers, the best education. It was a wonderful experience. But I kind of wanted to go just walk two blocks to school and then join my friends, my playground friends that I was with all summer. And there was all white staff, all white leadership principals, etc. So in my small mind, I wondered, well, why do we have to be divided like this when we were together all summer? Uh, Chester was a predominantly white community and then it had everything here as far as opportunities for work because it was an industrial age at that particular time. And when things started to change and, and folks decided that, um, you know, the term that they used was white flight, decided to leave the community and left the community, then changes took place where uh, the African-American community became the, uh, the major uh, race that was in, in, in the community. So I saw, actually saw that. 
I saw things happen when I went to school that, um, you know, you went to community schools, but then at a point in time, then they decided to bus uh, people of color to, to, the, um, to the white schools. Um, I know of times where we had, uh, you know, you, you just got enough uh, supplies to work, but we had teachers in our community who were invested in to our um, educational system in which I, which I attended. I also experienced where I know a lot of folks have not during the time, and I, I, I alluded to political situations, that I went to high school and middle school a half a, half a day through all my, through my years because of the fact there was not a high school. The high school burned down in my middle school years. We had to share the school. Uh, the, the middle school had to share the school with the high school and vice versa. So I went through that and I knew I only got what I could get through that particular time. But then as I went through and went to college and saw that other people had some of the things that they, the teachers said, this is just a review. To me, it wasn't a review because we couldn't, we couldn't capture all the things in just a half a day. But perseverance and um, studying and making sure that I knew I was going after a particular goal is to get my degree. I made sure I did what I had to do. I think helped to shape my character. And then, of course, when you get to high school, um, I went to um, Archbishop Prendergast High School and they, um, I saw that we had at least six blacks in the freshman class. And I was like, really thrilled, you know, there's some more black people, you know, this is wonderful, this is great. And um, we all, of course, stuck together. And I mean, there was thousands of them. And um, I remember that they thought that none of us would go to college. You know, that was their thing. And they were insisting that we would take a business track instead of the academic track. And we were all insistent that we were taking the academic track. And that's what we did and prevailed at it and, and did very well. You know, but even at that, they still were persistent that we were going to college. I ended up going to Cheney, and that was the best experience I could have had, um, not realizing it at the time. Well, it was more of a friendly, family friendly, um, and they cared about you. So that made a big difference. Um, then I went to um Westchester and it was not the same. I did graduate work there. And I mean, you know, I was just going to get the, the education. I wasn't thinking about, um, you know, any of the socializing. I didn't have time for any of that because um, that was later in life, you know. So um, I just, you know, did that. And even the same thing with Penn State took classes, you know, off campus and things like that. So, you know, to get my degrees. So I wish I could see those same people today <laughs> and tell them, hey, look what happened. <laughs> when I graduated, I graduated from Cheney University, what is now Cheney University. Um, was able to get a job in the Southeast, what is now the Southeast Delco School District. But just to make a point, I tried every year to get a job in the Chichester School District, you know, applications that by that time they did have some, a few black teachers, but, um, you know, I'm just saying to myself, why am I traveling all the way out to Sharon Hill and Darby when I can, I live right here in the school district, why can't I teach here? So I tried year after year to put in an app application and we don't have any positions or they would say oh, we don't have an application from a Patricia Thomas they just constantly did that I was able to get a job as a long-term sub because they just couldn't find anybody else to take that position and I continued to put in applications at Chichester but you know there was never any opening even though there were several but they just never picked me um, I just figured I'm a graduate of Chichester. Why aren't they trying to give me a job? So finally, a fellow teacher um, who I was working with, her husband was a lawyer, and he offered to help me for free and take my case to the EEOC. And some miracle happened. I got a job just like that, you know. Then when I applied for college, 
I wanted to go to Westchester at that time, Westchester State Teachers College, because that's where my aunt went. That's where my great aunt went. They were teachers. So, of course, I wanted to follow. But when I received my letter, which I should have saved, being young and celebrate and simple, I threw it away. But the letter said, Dear Dolores Shelton, we are so sorry that we cannot accept you at this time. We have reached our quota, which meant that they had got enough black, their quota of black children. So I said, what, you know, what am I going to do? And my father, who worked for Delaware County National Bank, said, don't worry. He went to work the next day. He spoke to Mr. Pugh, you know, the Pugh family who owns Sun Oil and Sun Ship, and also the vice president. They made a phone call. They called Cheney. The next day or so, I got a call to come I was accepted at Cheney, all black school. Wow, they were the best four years of my life. I got to be a cheerleader. I got to be in a drama club. I got to just do everything that, to be like every other young black teenager. song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun. Until victory, hope is won. I'm originally from uh, Wilmington, Delaware, uh, North Wilmington. So the first exit when you leave Delaware County in the state of Pennsylvania and go into Delaware, uh, that is where my original stomping ground is. I grew up uh, and went to AI DuPont High School. I played basketball there. Uh, I also played for a traveling basketball team, which is where my connection to Delaware County comes from, because I played for a team called the Rebels, which was coached by Bill McDonough uh, and played blue chip basketball. And so all my teammates were from the Upper Darby, Lansdowne, uh, Haverford Township area, and a lot of them still live there. And so, you know, I uh, love Delaware County and love being here and wanted to come back and be near my friends and family. There are historically there have been portions of Delaware County that have been underserved um, and underrepresented in the government. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why I ran for county government is really, you know, to make sure that the county government represents everyone and works for everyone uh, equitably across the board um, and making sure that those individuals in our community get what they need um, in order to live a happy and healthy life in Delaware County. Well, growing up in Delaware County uh, was very unique at the time. We were kind of, it was, the, the township was very divided in Darby Township. You had one side that was predominantly made up of uh, white and the other side made up mostly of blacks. And, you know, therefore, it seems like maybe one side had a little more than the other side or one side was predeemed as the kind of the upper class and blacks was considered as the lower class. Um, but I had the opportunity when we went to school is that our, at least our schools were, were mixed. And, you know, we kind of integrated together. Um, you know, we played sports together and, you, you know, it was very unique, but most times after, outside of school, we all kind of stayed in our own areas at that time. We didn't too much interact or mingle with one another. It was more so 
Um, you know, the way it was divided, they stayed on their side. We basically stayed on our side. Similar, I grew up in Yaden, so the William Penn School District. And so Yaden, of course, was predominantly African-American. And so the community was very, I think, close-knit at the time. My street, as time went on, became less diverse. When I was younger, I definitely had more diverse neighbors. I will share that when I was in school, most of the diversity came within like the African diaspora. So people from the African continent or the Caribbean were where most of our diversity came from. I will say I didn't really have an appreciation for the diversity of Delaware County until probably college, honestly, uh, just seeing how different other aspects of Delaware County were as it relates to socioeconomic um, outcomes, but then also just the diversity of the neighborhoods that actually existed. I think being in this role has given me a different appreciation for how diverse Delaware County was, but I definitely think that my neighborhood was very close knit, but not as diverse as time has went on. And I think as Councilman Womack said that it has become more apparent that certain parts of Delaware County seem to be more heavily prevalent with diversity and even within municipalities where there's diversity, um, the diversity is often segregated. You know, what we really tried to focus Focus on and from the, I mean, you know, we've had the pandemic, uh, which in some ways has allowed us to build more channels of communication within, with different communities. But we have 49 municipalities and we have really, really worked over the last three years to increase our communication with all of our communities and to make sure that each and every one of our communities has access to supports that they need understand what the county can provide in terms of supports for those municipalities and also be a help and a support for grant funding or to educate to go after state funding or federal funding or county funding. And the goal there is to make sure that everyone has has what they need to be able to build a new park, improve their park, uh, you know, build the infrastructure that they see is what they need for their community. And and that level of communication had not been there before. Uh, You know, one of the examples is our diversity, equity, inclusion officer whose job is both internal and external. And so our, our goals for her are really to work internally to make sure that we are, you know, we have um, we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and everything that we do in terms of our policies and our procedures and how we hire, how we do procurement processes, but also to be out in the community and be an outreach source to work with communities um, within Delaware County uh, to make sure that we are hearing all voices within our government. And so, you know, those are some of the things that I have faced. But as time went on, that has, you know, kind of, it's not as bad as it has been. There's more open relationships now where we have really had the opportunity to work together. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of things that really happened to make me see a difference is that we talked about these different things like the discrimination now. And I, and I think that some of the old guard was kind of stuck in their ways, but the new generation It's like they're starting to work together. So you don't see as much as the profile is going on now. Um, I think things that happen in other states and things that's been happening, like current events that's happened, like the George Floyd situation has really, you know, raised the bar here in Delaware County and and all over the state of Pennsylvania and and any other states, that these are things that we don't want to see happening. These are things that we we even speak against, and not just black speaking against it. I hear even um, white speaking against it as well. They weren't happy about it. You have some law enforcement that don't like what has happened in the past and has tried to make some changes. So I do see both sides of it. I see what happened then, and I see what's transitioning now, which is more of a, a positive road that we're moving forward to. I definitely... Uh, see the evolution. I think when I was growing up, the fact that Yaden was predominantly African-American at the time, it always provided a sense, I guess, of security that I didn't necessarily recognize. But one of the things that I did always recognize is, is that 
our law enforcement and also a lot of our municipal services were people who were white. And so they were always very friendly. And so when I grew up seeing law enforcement as a person or uh, institution that you would go to if you needed assistance, I think as I went to college uh, and ventured a little bit further out in Montgomery County, that was when I started to really um, appreciate how much uh, tension that actually existed between residents and the law enforcement that were sworn to protect them. Two of the things that I noticed that's really stood out um, as issues in uh, communities of color were really the idea that um, there weren't as much support for those areas as there were for the other areas in the county and gun violence. Um, and violence within our communities uh, were really two of the big issues. Um, and at, as you know, our district attorney's office has really worked first on a pilot program in the city of Chester and is now slowly expanding that outward into all of our areas in the community. Uh, but, you know, in the first two years of the program, gun violence is down by 63 percent in the city of Chester, which was a major issue uh, for us running and for us to come in and it was one, it was his top issue that he ran on. And so I'm very proud of the results that the program uh, has had. I would say the, um, that you can see the difference is more diverse now in our hiring practices. Um, you have a lot more people of color that's in management positions was never what happened. You weren't being you're not being targeted now because of what party affiliation you have. Um, you're not being targeted because what ethnic group you come from. It's a more diverse now than what it ever has been. And I think now that our government now is more transparent. Um, you know, we're, you know, trying to make sure that everyone knows how the government is functioning. We want to make sure that people even have a voice now, that they can, you know, speak on how they feel and some of the changes they would like to see made. It's more in inclusive now. It's not just a one party show. It's an all inclusive show now, regardless if you are a Republican, Democrat or independent. It does not matter. Uh, only thing we want to do is showcase what our county represents, people of all colors and all races and ethnic. So I am, you know, proud that we are seeing that change now. I mean, it's been long overdue, but we're finally starting to see some light of the day for our county. Yeah, absolutely. So the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Office was created in April of 2022. And so this role is really tasked to work with counsel in the executive director's office to think about how the county is functioning operationally, how we are thinking about how we hire and retain talent, making sure that people, again, are accessing opportunities based on their credentials um, and making sure that we are removing any barriers for people to apply to our jobs and making sure that a diverse set of um, applicants are being um, afforded the opportunity to even interview. We also look at the aspect of supplier diversity. Who do we procure our resources from, whether we're thinking about office supplies, whether we think about a consultant for a new initiative that we are working on, making sure that people that are um, racially or ethnically diverse, gender um, diverse and um, different around sexual orientation have access to um, multiple opportunities. I think it's really important that people recognize this office definitely does focus on race and ethnicity, but it is not limited to just focusing um, on race and ethnicity, but we focus on all aspects of demographics, including accessibility, people being veterans, um, and making sure that people see themselves not only um, as employees, but then also ensuring that they have equitable access to services. The role also does a lot of work with our forward-facing departments, such as housing, uh, the public, the health department, and also the prison, thinking about what are our programs to ensure that people have access to workforce development when maybe they're re-entering um, society. So it's an all-encompassing role and really here to serve as a thought partner to all departments and also the community to ensure that they feel that their voices are 
are being heard. We do do a lot of external events such as our MLK Day celebration that we just hosted. Um, that was an initiative of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Office, but then also we'll continue to do different activities with external partners such as um, Delaware County Pride, which will be here for the first time as a countywide initiative in June. I think continuing on the path that we're on, you know, what we are, have really been trying to do is eliminate barriers, um, create more access points for individuals within Delaware County to get to the services that they need in order to be successful. Uh, we have created the first ever health department in Delaware County, which has um, outlined so many disparities that exist in our communities. And a lot of those are impacting our black and brown uh, community members in Delaware County and really trying to make sure that everyone has that access to live a happy and healthy life is the goal and is what we're trying to do with our policies, our procedures, and the infrastructure that we're creating within the government. This is a government that the goal is for it to serve everyone and all residents of Delaware County and making sure that they have what they need. True to our God and true to our native land. I am the founder and chief executive officer of the Chester Cultural Arts and Technology Center. Our mission at the CAT, as we affectionately call it, is to eradicate poverty through arts and technology. And we have programs for children, we have families programs, and we also specialize in helping entrepreneurs in the um, Chester vicinity. And um, a lot of people from all parts of Delaware County come to join us in our sessions, in our technology classes, in our art classes. Um, we have a variety of services that you know, extend from children four years old to adults in their 70s. So, you know, the best place I always tell people, go to the website and check us out because I cannot tell you in one sitting how many um, programs that we have because of the various organizations that we partner with, um, the, the organizations that are in the CAT Center, we house nonprofit organizations, um, and we also partner with organizations that have their own house. And so when I was younger, um, I grew up in public housing in Delaware County in uh, Chester Township. And one of the things we used to do was drill team. Oh, it was special to be on a drill team in Chester. And those arts, those artistic trips that we used to take, the um, things we used to learn, the friendships, there were lifelong friendships. And I discovered my love of art very early. And when I, of course, became an adult, all of the programs that I have helped people gather, the successes of, of helping to mentor, and it just made sense for me to come back to Chester and develop something that would be viable for the community. And here I am. When I first walked into this building, I actually walked in to look at a possible space of about 400, 400 square feet because some of the students that I worked with um, in the past are adults now. And they came to me and said, you have got to start another drill team. You have got to build a family that we used to have because the community needs it. And I said, fine, I'll come in and I'll look at a, you know, I'll look at the space. And I got in here and it all just came to me. And I talked to the owner of the building and I said, listen, could you please develop all the space? And he was like, all of it? I said, all 6,000 square feet of it. And this is phase one of my dream. 
So right now, because of the current space, we have to kind of have our cultural arts and our technology classes kind of sharing the sp same space. But the ultimate dream is to have a building large enough to separate the two. And um, it was just something that came to me. I cannot explain it other than a higher power uh, when I walked in here because there are hallways here that wasn't there that I just envisioned. Um, and here we are four years later and you know, it's just, still being fruitful it's still you know being a powerhouse in the community and i'm just i'm just excited that i was a part of it in the next five years i would love to be in a place and space where i can put up pictures or dedicate rooms to people like bill dandridge um to people uh like um brandy wells to people like um, that I stood at their footsteps, Miss Monica Rhodes, that I stood at their footsteps. I learned from them. I wanna have a dance studio that's not shared space <laughs> with rental. <laughs> um, it's my dream to have a larger space so we can serve more of the community. We have programs that sometimes can't fit everybody in them, uh, you know, and it's real, it's realistic for us. And I hope in the next five or 10 years, we're able to hone a new space, a new cultural arts and technology center that just can be a phenomenal resource for Chester and vicinity. So that's my hope <laughs> and my dreams.